So welcome to the rise of the super being. I'm Vanderson Pires and today it's the first episode of 2020. Our producer is Callan Walker and our guest today is Dr. Elliot Bell. I'm really, really, really interesting uh, conversation. Really came to, to have this conversation with Dr. Elliot for, for a long time now. And finally, we managed to align our schedule together. Also, I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you so much for all the support we've been getting from the podcast. Again, the idea of the, the, uh, the rise of the super being, it's to bring people with their expertise to give us practical tools to make our emotional fitness better. Remember, emotional fitness, it's something we can always improve. So the idea of the rise of the super being started with live events at the combat room when I was inviting people to come and to, to talk to us about uh, uh, well-being, uh, mental health, and all the, those important subjects for, for, for a community. And Dr. Elliot and his wife, Chris Bell, they came to one of the first, and they, they spoke with, with us about the five steps of well-being. That was really, really, really good. And also, so Dr. Dr. Elliot Bell, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you for coming here. No, look, thanks for the, the invite. Um, <laughs> I'm in, in pretty uh, auspicious company with uh, the amazing guests that you've had on. So mm. uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Elliot Bell is a senior lecturer at the University of Otago and clinical psychologist. He's also a brown belt in karate, kyokushin, and blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, he also wrote this um, book with, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say his name right, and so it's J.K., so John Kirwan. Yeah, so the first one, for the ones that are listening, it's, 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 oops, the first one, it's this one here. All Blacks Don't Cry, A Story of Hope. So have a look, I recommend. And the second one was Stand By Me. Uh, helping your team through tough times. So that's the second book. And those two books, on the end, you're going to see a really cool interview as well with Dr. Elliot. So I recommend those, those two good reads, reads. So Dr. Elliot, <laughs> so how did you become a, a clinical psychologist? How, how was the, the journey? Well, how was your inspiration to... Um, what, what happened... Uh, well, I, I left school and I didn't have a lot of direction, um, but I knew I wanted to study at university. And because I didn't really know what, what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go, I, wanted to, I, I chose a subject that I thought would be the most general and have the most application. I thought, oh, I'll do psych, you know, mm -hmm. and we'll see, we'll see, you know, whatever I end up doing, I'm sure I'll, 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 I'll value the, the, the learning about psychology. And um, so, so I... I did the degree and um, the, the, you know, the bachelor's degree. When I left uh, university, um, I did a bit of, bit of backpacking and that sort of thing. My, um, my family, uh, both, both my parents uh, have um, Irish Catholic uh, backgrounds and there was a strong um, kind of service mentality um, you know, as part of the, the culture of my, my home and my community growing up. Um, and both my parents worked in the public service their whole lives. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't know too many people, um, you know, who worked for, for private companies and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it sort of seemed natural to me to, to kind of think about, you know, um, how, how can I kind of do good things? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I worked for, for Greenpeace for, for a period, you know, the environmental mm -hmm. group, and that was... Um, that was amazing. It was it was 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 really uh, rewarding. Um, I also I, I, I kind of got the 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 uh, yeah, there's that that notion that societal change uh, begins with personal change. Um, you know, with, without having read about that or sort of articulated it, I I kind of got that sense. You know, and mm -hmm. that that, that um, and at the same time, I'd also uh, worked at. Um, at IHC, it was the uh, I think it's called Idea Services now. It's um, it, it's an organisation which works with people with intellectual disabilities, 
and I was a support worker at IHC, and I really, I really enjoyed, you know, working with these people with problems. And and I didn't have any kind of professional or applied skills, but um, yeah, just just you know, connecting with with these these clients and and doing stuff with them. Um, and they 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 seem to respond well. They you know they enjoyed it when I I was looking after them and um, and so so I thought you know maybe um, there's an uh, an application of psychology mm. that that could could kind of bring these these things together. And then then I I um, uh, so 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 I discovered that you know you could train in clinical psychology um, as a graduate student. Uh, and so, so same as Lauren Bryce, who you've you, you've had on previously. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did the uh, the clinical psychology training program at, at that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And from from there, how was your journey towards uh, become a university lecturer? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, all the more the academic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've never stopped practicing clinically. So, so, um, but yeah, my my. My, my clinical psychology background um, for the first 10 years or so was in forensic mental health. So, so I worked um, for the district health board's central region forensic mental health service. Uh, and what the forensic mental health service does is, is they look after um, you know, psychiatric patients, people with mental health issues who come in contact with the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. So, so, so when, when, when mental health um, clients uh, come in contact with the criminal justice system rather than being looked after by mainstream or general mental health services, they get sort of filtered off to the forensic mental health service. Um, so, so, and, and it's, re- it's really interesting, good work. Um, you know, we, um, you know, I, I could do uh, reports for the court, um, could work in, in prisons, see the mental health clients who were there um, in the community or in the inpatient wards. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, some, some of these clients, they might, and there's, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out with a distinction here. There's, um, so the Forensic Mental Health Service, we, we're working with mental health clients who have contact with the criminal justice system. Slightly different than the um, correctional system you know i know that you um you, you do your work in prisons and mm. um you know you'll probably hear reference to to the psychologists that work there mm-hmm. um most of them would be working for the department of corrections and their brief is or at least it it, it, it it always was to to reduce reoffending. so so that's their focus but for for, uh, for us in forensic mental health we were working on um, um helping people who had a major mental illness um with their wellness because often, often with that group, it was the illness that was driving the offending behaviour. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, for example, uh, you will have heard of um, this this notion of not guilty by reason of insanity. Oh, could you please explain? You heard of this? So, uh-huh, so this yeah. is this is where um, someone commits a crime, a serious crime, and and a defence that's available to them um, is is um, not guilty by reason of insanity. So that that's where. Um, uh, the 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 illness they have has affected them um, such that they 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 didn't understand the the moral wrongfulness of their actions. Mm-hmm. So a, a classical scenario might be someone uh, has a psychotic illness. So so like 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 schizophrenia, where where they've lost touch with reality and they might be very paranoid. They have delusions or or hearing voices telling them to do things. And and in the context of that, um, those psychotic symptoms. Uh, you know, they might they might harm someone or even take someone's life, thinking mm-hmm. within their system of, of beliefs that that they they maybe they're even doing the right thing. Um, so so, you know, the humane disposition from the courts is not guilty by reason of insanity. So you don't go to jail, um, you go to hospital, and and you get you get treatment for your illness in hospital. Mm-hmm. So, and and, and that that's. Um, I know it's quite a difficult thing for some of the public to to get their heads around. You know, there's a bit of a um, a narrative out there that uh, you know people who get the insanity acquittal have kind of tricked the system. Mm-hmm. You know, I've tricked the system. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the 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 sort of provocative line that you sometimes see in the media or or, or social is um, 
Uh, they trick the system. They're going to a five-star hotel uh, instead of prison, <laughs> and they're going to get out in, in two weeks, and then they're going to be a ticking time bomb in the community, uh, inevitably uh, going to harm someone again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's just not like that at all. They, they, you know, Often these people are so unwell that um, you know, it might take quite a few years mm -hmm. for them to be stable enough and settled enough and well enough to to even start um you know progressing out into the community mm -hmm. um and um i can tell you about some interesting research we, we, we're doing with that group at, um, at, at some stage but um um yeah yeah so 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 that was the that was the the clinical work i did for about 10 years mm -hmm. I, I think um you know when you come out of university um, you know, you've just had your exams and you're, you're, you're pretty on top of the, the literature. You know, you're quite, quite sharp. It's, mm -hmm. probably, it's probably a little bit like, you know, BJJ when you, 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 you compete in a tournament. You know, you've been, mm -hmm. you've been drilling and yeah, yeah. Um, what, are they, what do they call it, the shark tank or, yeah. or whatever. You know, pretty, you're pretty sharp. And, uh -huh. and, um, uh, and I think the thing with, with clinicians, you know, you get busy, you might have leadership roles and do, do more administrative stuff and you, you can kind of lose your connection with the science a little bit mm -hmm. it can be a little bit of drift and you know i was pretty conscientious but even i noticed that um you know i was kind of gathering um research papers intending to read them but they were forming an increasingly high pile on my <laughs> desk and never getting to them and i thought look I, I, it's it's probably a good time to refresh and sharpen and so i enrolled in a phd at um, the University of Otago in Wellington, uh, and and that's that's where I'm teaching at the moment, and it's um, yeah yeah so so um, around the same time I was teaching a, a, a single paper uh, part time and and studying and so so I got connected with the, with the, the medical school there and um, yeah I got kind of got offered to do more and more teaching and the job got bigger and bigger and eventually. Um, uh, turned into a what's called a confirmation path appointment, which is like the American notion of uh, tenure, mm -hmm. where you, you're kind of like on a probation period, and mm -hmm. they give you a few years to publish some papers, and, yeah, and yeah. if you publish them, they say, okay, you can stay. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah. So, so at that point, uh, you know, I was I was doing too much um, academic work to to be able to work in the forensic service at the same time. Um, so now my, 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 for, 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 for some time, my clinical work has been in private practice. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, um, office space in the city and, you know, I, I, I get referrals or self referrals and, and, um, and, and I do therapy with, with people in the community. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just, just by curiosity about the research you just mentioned, mm. um, what's, what's the, the, the ratio of, uh, people who through the treatment, become turnover or something like that or what's the what's the percent the, the outcomes and yeah yeah, yeah now that well this is that's the research question um mm. uh and uh we the the, the answer is we, we we don't know um and anecdotally you know for, for those of us who work in the system uh or have worked in the system you know we see good outcomes you know and it's very very unusual for someone to to rehab um, through the forensic service and and get discharged um, and then offend again. Mm -hmm. That's very very unusual. But but you know good kind of systematic robust um, analysis of that hasn't really been done. Mm -hmm. So so one of the studies that um, I'm working on at the moment is a it's called a cohort study or a retrospective cohort study. So so we've we've identified within the central region service um, all of the insanity equities since about 19 or sort of the late 1980s um, forensic services were, were sort of organized in a in a uniform way at that point in New Zealand's um, kind of legal um, system history and so so we, we we're looking at um, so, so we've, we've, we've looked through all their files and we're tracking their um, offending their their health and their functional outcomes so, so what we want to be able to say at the end of the day is that, um, uh, you know, what proportion reoffend, you know, what proportion 
get unwell again and have to go back into hospital? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, what what proportion thrive? You know, and get jobs, um, stay out of hospital, that sort of thing. So, so that's a big um, research project we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. amazing. So super interesting. So, Dr. Elliot, what's so your expertise? It's with well-being. Uh, one of your expertise. So, what what do you mean by well-being? What's the definition of well-being? Yeah, yeah. Well, well um, there, there is a World Health Organization definition, and it talks about things like um, uh, reaching your potential and being able to manage stress and contributing to your community, and and it, it's quite a sort of a wordy definition. Um, but but you know I kind of I kind of like these notions like emotional fitness that that, that you talk about, Anderson. Mm. Um, uh, I, I guess for me, I, I I I might use the term psychological fitness or or um, psychological condition. Um, so so much you know in the way like um, you think about your physical condition or your physical fitness. Mm-hmm. Um, you know you, you you kind of have a sense of whether you're in shape or or you know you haven't been looking after your your fitness but I think it's the same with with um, with well-being you know if you think of it as your your psychological condition or your emotional fitness um, I, I think that's a good way of of conceptualizing it really yeah mm-hmm. and what's yeah. what's the what's the research has been showing about uh, what can enhance people's yeah well-being? yeah well well um, I guess the other thing I'll say about well-being is um, Often it's used sort of synonymously with happiness, and um, I guess the problem with that is is happiness. Um, it probably overemphasizes the emotional component of well-being. I mean, happiness is great, and it's 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 a it's a part of well-being. But um, you know, well-being is not all about positive emotions. So, um, and look, there's, there's there's lots of different ways you might carve up. You know what are the components of well-being, but but one that's 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 pretty robust in terms of its evidence base. Um, that that you know the, the listeners or viewers might um, want to follow up with is is Martin Seligman's work on um, on well-being, and he he talks about um, this acronym uh, PERMA. So it's P E R M A, and um, he's identified these as, as as independent contributors to well-being. So the the P is um, for positive emotions. So that's kind of like the happiness bit. It's um, this notion of of pleasures. Um, uh, um, you know, the, the the kind of immediate feel good type of things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, telling jokes. Um, um, having something nice to eat, um, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, one, one of the reasons why um, I was I was really happy to to, to come and talk to you um, today is, is you know I think the combat room um, you know is is a wonderful example of a, um, a a community that that has lots of that contributes to well being in lots of, of ways and mm-hmm. and in terms of the the positive emotion component. Um, you know, I was quite struck when I, I, I first uh, went to the uh, combat room um, at you know the the kind of smiling and laughing and but it was it was it was re, you know it was really relaxed you know um, mm-hmm. you know I've been to other um, martial arts um, you know, dojos academies and mm-hmm. yeah these guys kind of <laughs> on their own kind of brooding and you know uh, <laughs> it was none of that it was quite quite different so so positive emotion and. Um, and the one of the key things with that is, in terms of the application, is um, to to kind of get the most out of positive emotion. You you want to sort of schedule it intermittently, mm-hmm. um, uh, because because they habituate. You know, you you desensitize. Um, a good a good a good um, example of that is um, have have you have you? I'm not sure what sort of diet. A dietary regime you're in at the moment. You're fasting, uh, I think. Last yeah, time we spoke. Yeah, I'm still fasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but do you, have you ever, ever had uh, good old kiwi uh, fish and chips? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, most most people can relate to this. It's that that yeah. um, it's kind of like a a law of diminishing returns. You know, um, uh, I love you, that. Yeah, you know, you, you, when you when you're making your order, you're kind of salivating. You just can't wait. And um, uh-huh. but but you know, sort of halfway through the meal. You're like, um, um, why on earth did I order this? You know, and by the time you finish, you're like, oh, I'm, 
I'm not having those again, you know. Yeah. And, and so that, that's the sort of habituation, you know, you can mm -hmm. have them too often. So, so that's the P. Um, um, the, the E is for engagement. Uh, and um, that's this, this notion of, if we think of, of um, positive emotions being like pleasures, um, you know, eating an ice cream, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and engagement's more about gratifications, which is a little bit different. It's, it's kind of something that's, that's positive, but it's more sort of satisfying in, 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 a, in a deeper way. Um, and, you know, typically it's, it's uh, well, perhaps at its, um, at, its, at its ultimate kind of end point would, would be notions like flow. And I, we, we've talked about flow before, mm -hmm. you, yes. you and I. Um, yeah. um, so this is this notion of kind of being in the zone. You know, when you're, when you're doing something you're good at um, and you're adequately sort of challenged, um, you know, time can kind of stand still and you're just fully engaged and you're not necessarily feeling um, emotionally amazing. You might not have a sense of any emotional component, but, it, but it's, it's, it's this very gratifying state. Now, I'm not saying that I, I experience flow and you don't have to experience flow to experience engagement, mm -hmm. um, but that, that's kind of a, um, the, 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 the sort of nth degree of flow. And you might see it in um, like... Uh, rock climbers um, um, uh, or uh, yeah, virtuoso musicians. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think we talked about it. Like, like I think you said you, you, you simply might have a sense of it if you're rolling with a black belt, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and you're feeling um, like you're really in the zone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I remember the first time I heard this expression about the flow and I, even after I went to, to buy the book, yeah, it was from, from, from you. So you told me about that and... And when you told me, was makes so much sense to me because I, I I felt that exactly with those examples you just gave about uh, yeah. um, even playing guitar a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you get that uh, you know when you learn a new song or or rolling as well. You know, and it sometimes doesn't even need to be uh, another black belt. Another person who can give you that good mm -hmm. energy, and sometimes you're just there and. And you, you know, the time goes by and you have no idea and you're just fully present and having that uh, really good, uh, good mm -hmm. uh, feeling. You know, it's, yeah, I, uh, thank you for, for introducing me to that because after I read the book and gave me so much more awareness about uh, the, that state of the mind, you know, and the, yeah. and the capacity, the, the, the positive impact, the, the flow has... On, yeah. on ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mi Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi is a psychologist who, who wrote Flow yeah. for people who, who might want to follow that up. Um, yeah, so so I guess the takeaway there is is uh, you, you know um, em embrace the things that that you you know you 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 you're, you're okay at that you're good at. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to be the best at it, but but um, you know do those things that you do well. Um, you know that's part of part of well being. Mm -hmm. So what are we up to? We did P. E, e. Uh, R, so so relationships, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah, will come as no no surprise really um, from an evolutionary context. You know, we're social beings; we've survived through mm -hmm. being social, um, and yeah, there is there is something therapeutic about good company. Um, uh, yeah, I'll talk about it in the context of depression treatment, but. Um, um, yeah, an interesting, and, and, and an interesting thing here is that um, um, you know one of the most reliable ways to to spike your um, positive emotion mm -hmm. um, in the short term is through an act of kindness. Ah, oh, that's yeah. so beautiful. That's so powerful. Yeah, yeah, I and, love and, that. And, and I think um, uh, you might have talked about that with. With Arjun and and, mm -hmm. and and others on the on the podcast, but um, um yeah, there's there's a, there's a neat um, experiment. Sometimes I have my students do um, uh, is um, just 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 experiment for yourself on um, noticing your emotional state after you do something pleasant. So so that might be, you know, the um, Ben and Jerry's cookies and cream 
ice cream um, uh, and notice notice how how positive you feel notice how sustained the positive emotion is and and then compare that with how you feel when you do something for someone else when you, mm -hmm. you do an act of kindness and 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 you know generally people will will notice that, that the act of kindness was was far more um, impacting mm -hmm. than than the the pleasant experience mm -hmm. so um, so so yeah that, that sort of speaks to the upsides of, of social connection um, and the other thing is is um, loneliness is really strongly associated with poor mental health outcomes mm. um, whereas having confidants is associated with having good mental health outcomes you know having people you can you can talk to um, uh, and, and so, so when we're treating someone for, for depression, um, you know, a really powerful mood enhancing technique is to um, encourage our clients to, to identify people whose company they enjoy and, and seek them out. You know, that, that as I said, the, the right company can be inherently antidepressant. Um, uh, it, it can be challenging kind of um, helping the depressed person um, take that on board because often they're, they're, they're quite um, pessimistic and negative in their in their outlook while they're depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that's a good one to experiment with as well with my clients. So you know you you might be expecting that it's not going to make a difference, but let's just experiment and see. And and again, nine times out of ten, they, they make the call, they speak to to their friend, and and they come back to me the next week and say, yeah, yeah, I felt quite a lot better after I'd done that, even though I didn't think I would. Mm -hmm. You know that was probably the depression talking. Um, so, so yeah, what's that? P E R, R. um, so M, uh, -huh. uh, what do you think that is? Spot quiz. Good question. M. Mm. I don't know. I have okay. no idea. It's, uh. um, it's meaning. Meaning. So, so ah. this is sort of a, if, if you like a, a, um, deeper level still to gratification. So we've got, you know, pleasures, gratifications, meaning, um, yeah, yeah, you know, there's 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 something about uh, doing something for the greater good, uh, um, um, you know, beyond yourself. That 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 really does um, again seem to pack a punch mm -hmm. in, in terms of of well being. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So so uh, you know, it could be getting involved in a cause. Um, it could be all all, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I was really going back to the, the sort of the, the, the great way the combat room sort of fits with this is, um, um, you know, I think when you've done tournaments, sometimes you, you, you have a sort of donation yeah, system yeah. of food. Yeah, right? we always, yeah, we yeah. always give back. And yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, does that go to, is it the Home of Compassion or the Night Shelter? Or? Yeah, we, we did it for pretty much all, even for the, um, some animals, uh, association oh, the SPCA. SPCA. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. we gave it to the kitten inn. So um, uh, the uh, Wellington Super Kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also for the uh, woman refuge as well. Women's refuge. Yeah. Right. So right. we always, yeah, every single competition. This is something we always give something back. Even tonight as well, we're gonna do a, uh, we're gonna have a workshop with uh, Hickson Grace's daughter and. Nice. Uh, I asked her if she was um, can you donate her time with the, so we can give some Koha donations for the bushfires in Australia. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. so we, I, I think it's very important. It's so interesting you said that because even one of my favorite books, it's Men Searching for Meaning. Um, Is it Victor Frankl? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. such a inf powerful, influential mm. book and and talks exactly yeah. exactly about what you mentioned before. And and I think for us as a community as well, it's so important to get involved. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting what you said about the act of kind as well. I had a friend uh, one day we were kind of, he came really serious, you know, talking about, uh, you know, I'm super depressed. And that was exactly what I said to him. I said, man, get a $5 note, put in an envelope, go around the neighborhood and the person, you know, randomly just put on their letterbox, 
it's just an act of kindness. You're not going to expect anything in return. The person doesn't even know you to say mm-hmm. thank you. But you know, tell me how you're going to feel after you do that. And he laughed. You know? So after a few weeks, he told me he right. did. And it was so interesting to hear that he said, yeah, it does make me feel better. Yeah. You know, in some weird way, I found, I found some pleasure of doing that. Yeah, 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 amazing. And, and uh, I think in Man's Search for Meaning, uh, it, was, it was the, um, uh, yeah, Frankel's, um, uh, his, his contemporaries in the concentration camps who, mm-hmm. who had a, a sort of a sense of meaning that, that, that did better. Yes. And, and, yeah. and um, you know, um, yeah, yeah, who, 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 who survived better in mm-hmm. that, that awful, awful environment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, amazingly powerful and... Um, and so the the, so the last for one being yeah. for meaning, um, uh, and and so so yeah, the, the, the takeaway for that one is um, you know find something that's meaningful mm-hmm. for you, you know, and um, you know, some people talk about you know what's your why, or you know, mm-hmm. um, in another therapy tradition called acceptance and commitment therapy, um, it's about the identification of values, you know, it, it's sort of it's uh, you know what, what's where, where does your where's your true north, you know, what's what's meaningful for you. Mm-hmm. So doctor, uh, just before we go for the next one, can you please, uh, what, what's, what's, what's your advice to, for someone to find their meaning, meaning in life? So the why, so what's, what's your advice on that? Yeah. Um, well, it's a, it's a, it depends what sort of level you're tackling it on. I mean, um, uh, Look, I, th- I think just self-reflection goes goes a long way. I think people people know what's what's important to them, mm-hmm. um, uh, and 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 like I say, it could be it could be a thing, you know, it could be a cause. Um, but but equally, you know, I think this this notion of values is is really important. Um, um, and 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 if you if you Google acceptance and commitment therapy or, or ACT, um, that that'll take you to web-based questionnaires that. Um, that, that help you identify your values, um, or, or you know, you just just think about what's what's important to me. You know, it mm-hmm. might be family, it might be learning, and uh, but there's something different about values and goals. So it's not goals, um, it's values. So it's 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 not destinations, it's directions. Mm. Uh, and the the beauty of that is, um, and this is this is a, a, a been hugely therapeutic clinically for people in, in, in the cognitive behavioral therapies is um, if, you, if you know what that true north is, you know, if you know what your values are, uh, when you get often points of stress or distress are around um, times when, you know, you feel you're being pulled off away from your values, you know, something, something's happening and, um, and it's kind of hard to stay true to your values. You know, you might be... Um, uh, maybe you're being bullied, you know, or um, uh, you're uh, you're in a social group and and you're doing stuff that you don't want to do. Um, um, yeah, it could be it could be lots of different things. And um, so 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 values give you a reference point, and you can ask yourself: Is is what I'm kind of doing it? Though I've got, I'm at a choice point. You know, do I do I want to go towards or away from my values? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so that can be be incredibly useful, um, uh, and 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 often, you know, I know that that you're you're a, um, a great mindfulness practitioner, mm-hmm. and and one of the clinical applications of of mindfulness is in that context, you know, um, helping you let go of the distressing feelings that you have when you stay on track. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like. Um, the 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 metaphor is you're you're driving in a car and you know you're on a road trip and you're heading north that's your direction but um you know the the you got people in the back seat and these could this could be self talk you know um telling you are um you're not good enough or you know you can't do it like like maybe maybe you you know you your your value might be um um you know to to pursue you know, to be be all you can be um. Um, in, in, a, in a physical fitness sense, you know, you, mm-hmm. you might, um, uh, that might be about going to jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, but, but sometimes the biggest challenge is, is, is getting yourself out the door and getting yourself into the dojo, right? Yeah. Into the academy. Mm-hmm. And, and um, so, so, you know, you can mindfully let go of the self-talk 
um, and, and stay um, on path and on track um, in line with your values. Mm -hmm. I remember you gave me one example and also so brilliant. The, um, one day we were talking about, uh, about that and you said about, uh, you know, thoughts are kind of that, uh, that you know, friend, you don't like that much, but knock on your door and say, hey, can <laughs> I stay? Can you please um, tell this, this example you gave him? Um, yeah, yeah. Look, I, Do you remember I, that? Well, I, I know there are various yeah, yeah. of it, and, uh -huh. and so many of them, I can't remember the exact details, but um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it can be useful to externalize. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the big problems um, that people have in, 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 in mental um, health conditions is that they believe their thoughts are facts, mm -hmm. you know, and, and one of the primary messages that we try to give our clients, um, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy is that, well, well, let's, let's just, just for a start, let's consider them as ideas. Now they may be factual, but they, they might not be, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and maybe it's some of the ones that aren't facts that are causing you, um, distress. Uh, and and so so I, I think you know whatever metaphor you use to describe mm -hmm. this um, this thought um, that's a good one. another one is a bully you know sometimes mm -hmm. people can can really relate to that you know that their their thoughts feel like bullies and and um, and and often and this this is this particularly in anxiety um, you know standing up to those thoughts is anxiety provoking just like standing up to a bully is mm -hmm. but you know the more you do it you know, pretty soon the bully gets annoyed and goes and bullies someone else. Mm -hmm. And, and anxiety is kind of like that as well. Mm. Uh, you know, you, it's desensitization. Yeah. That's interesting. Do we finish? We stop in the M? No, what's... I think we're up to A. Yeah, A. Which is um, achievement. Achievement. Yeah, mm. yeah. And um, yeah, you know, the, 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 there does seem to be something very powerful that, that, that we get from a sense of achievement. Mm -hmm. um, um, and you know we 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 use this in in um, in the, the treatment of depression as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the two 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 quite um, powerful mechanisms which 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 lift mood in uh, depression are giving people a sense well, well is 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 activity. Um, so, so yeah, one, one of the things we, we start with is, is activating a person who's depressed because often, you know, they, they withdraw, mm -hmm. um, that that's the, the natural, uh, behavioral response. If, if, you know, your worldview is, is negative, you know, you pull back. Mm -hmm. So we try to activate depressed clients and, and one of the ways activation works is that people do stuff. And when you do stuff, you can get a sense of achievement or enjoyment. And both of those will lift your mood. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, uh, so enjoyment that might be something like um, having having a, a nice coffee, you know, or, or having that ice cream, you know, mm -hmm. what what whatever. Um, or it might be watching a movie, you know, a really good movie um, that can that can spike your mood. Um, uh, achievement might not be something that you enjoy, but but it could be. Um, are quite powerful all the same so so for someone who's depressed it might you know they might be kind of behind on paying their bills or you know and and, and they might just sit down one morning and, and kind of go through a lot of stuff on their to-do list and, and and square it away and you know it wasn't fun mm -hmm. uh, but it gave them a sense of achievement um, some people think about um, going to the gym in the same way you, you know it's hurts while you're in there but but incredibly satisfying after Afterwards, you've finished yeah. um, and then sometimes um, things give you a sense of achievement and enjoyment. You know, maybe that, you know, learning that new piece on the guitar. You know, you, mm -hmm. might, you might enjoy it even though it's challenging at times. Yeah. Um, uh, but you also have a sense of achievement as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a, 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 a achievement. So, so I guess that's 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 um, that's about you know just just the power of doing things really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so awesome. So please, can you tell again the the so the letter? So we start with a P. P. Positive emotion. Right. E for engagement. Engagement. R for relationships. Mm -hmm. M for meaning. for meaning. A for achievement. For achievement. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. that's brilliant. Really interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, and then you know they, they can kind of interact with each other and often it's in the context of relationships that you know you might experience pleasant emotions or or you mm -hmm. might 
achieve things or you might do meaningful stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so useful. That's really... So what's, what's caused people to struggle with, um, with uh, the mental, their mental health? Um, yeah, you, you know, I, I think um, the honest answer is we don't, know, we don't know exactly, you know, for sure what the reasons are. But the, mm -hmm. um, a common kind of working understanding that, that we have is this, this notion of a um, um, stress vulnerability model. Mm. So, so what this says is that, um, you know, we've all got um, um, a, a vulnerability, a genetic vulner vulnerability that we've, we've inherited. Mm. Um, and, uh, but, but that doesn't mean you die as cast. It doesn't mean you're going to get unwell. Um, there's typically is, is some sort of um, life stressor, which, which might trigger um, the illness episode. So, so, so that's the kind of nature nurture um, mix. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, a, a, a little and a little metaphor that that I use in in in, in one of my classes is to think about um, think about you go to the beach. You, you're you still surfing? You, you a little bit, a little bit. Still yeah, very white belt on that. Oh, right, right, <laughs> right. Um, uh, but but let's say. You're you're on the south coast, um, mm -hmm. maybe um, I don't know Lyle Bay or somewhere. Uh, you've, you've gone for a swim, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and and, a, and a, a kind of a freak wave comes up. Um, now, depending how tall you are, that may or may not go over your head mm -hmm. and wipe you out. Um, so that's kind of like the inherit. Your height is kind of like the inherited vulnerability. If you're shorter, you know it's not your fault that you were born. Um, shorter, mm -hmm. um, and it's not your achievement that you were born taller. But but you know the taller person's gonna gonna potentially cope better with the big wave, and the wave is the stressor. So the stressor might be job loss, relationship breakup, um, you know, some sort of um, victimization. Um, uh, you know, so 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 that's the, the kind of bad thing that happens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, so we've got this, the nature bit, um, that's the height. Um, the nurture bit is the vulnerability, um, or, or protection, um, that, that is, is learnt, um, along the way. So that might be your capacity to swim. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of analogous to your, um, coping, um, ability. Um, so the, the, the person who's five foot six who, who might get wiped out by the wave, um, a wave that's six feet, uh, and the six foot six person doesn't get wiped out. But if the wave is seven foot six, they're both going to get wiped out. And it might actually be the smaller person who copes better if they can swim, you know, if they've learned to swim, mm -hmm. okay, because they've got better um, coping strategies. Wow, yeah, what a great um, ex example, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, um, but yeah, the the, uh, the 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 other factors in there, of course, and and yeah, I think I think resilience and coping, um, it, it's always a person environment interaction, um, uh, and so you know the the social support is massively is a massive factor in, in terms of, like if you get unwell um, and you've got people around you who can help you. Or you start getting well, you've got people around who can help you, who can advocate for you, you know, who can look after you. Um, that's massively protective. Uh, it's a different ball game, you know, when you're on your own. Mm -hmm. so, so to go back to the analogy, um, uh, community or family support might be, um, you know, the lifeguards on the beach. You know, if you swing between the waves, uh, you know, you've got that environmental support to reduce the risk of being wiped out by the wave or the, mm -hmm. the life event. That's so interesting. So, Doctor Elliot, how prevalent is mental illness? Mm. Um, look, it, it's 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 a hard thing to to measure with with exactness, but um, you know we think it might be between one and six and two and five uh, people will will experience a, a a mental health condition over the course of their life. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there's a really good study called uh, Tera Hinanaro that. Our Ministry of Health undertook. It's a it's a chapter of the World Mental Health Survey, which the World Health Organization um, uh, has been working on um, out of Harvard University. And 
Yeah, yeah. So, so we've got we've got pretty good, robust local um, data on on prevalence rates. The 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 only kind of catch there is is you know we we know a reasonable amount of, um, um, about the prevalence of of the more more common sort of milder to moderate um, severity conditions, but not as much about um, the schizophrenia, you know, the, the, the people, people with psychosis, at least the ones at the kind of um, severe end of that. Uh, because the, the, the way that you, you estimate prevalence is you train people in structured clinical interviews. These are like lay people mm. uh, and they, they, they go around the streets, they knock on your door um, and people who will let them in, they, they, they do a, an extended structured interview with them. It's a very reliable way to, to detect um, presence of, of an illness. But um, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a reasonable proportion of people with with major mental illnesses who who might not be living in the community. You know, they might be um, in hospitals or sometimes maybe on, on on living on the street or, or or in prisons. So so you can't as accurately sample them. But but that's the that's the breakdown. Yeah, mm, that's interesting. So what are the the most common mental health? Uh, Disorders. Yeah. Um, well, anxiety and depression uh, mm -hmm. are, the, are the big ones. Um, you know, b between them, that might that might be, you know, thirty to forty percent or more of, of, of all mental health conditions. Um, yeah. You know, um, John John Kerwin, who I, I collaborated with in, 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 in some of his, his um, the stuff he's written. Yeah, he calls it the common cold of, of mental health, and I think mm -hmm. it's a it's a good analogy. Yeah. You know. And also, it's kind of destigmatizing, you know, that there's no there's no shame in catching a cold, you know. Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't be any shame in, in, in experiencing depression or anxiety. Mm. And what's the how how do you treat that? So when someone comes to you on on your um, to at the seek for yeah at the clinic to seek yeah. for for help. So what's the what's the procedure when someone is depressed or with uh, yeah anxiety? Yeah. Well. Well. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist, so 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 uh, um, I don't prescribe medications. The 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 medical practitioners who specialise in mental health are psychiatrists, mm -hmm. um, and so people, uh, you know, you can certainly um, uh, you know, pharmacotherapy or, or, or drug therapy is is a cornerstone treatment of many many uh, mental health conditions. So that would typically be provided by a psychiatrist or a, or a general practitioner. Um, so so clinical psychologists. Uh, we we deliver evidence based psychological therapies, uh, and and the probably the, the the class of therapies that has the most uh, empirical support, and that's not to say others don't, but mm -hmm. but the, the 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 group that has the the sort of most extensive literature supporting it is the cognitive behavioural therapies, and and that's what I practice, and and um, you know the. Uh, um, well recommended treatments for anxiety and depression and and, and that's mainly what I see um, in my clinic mm -hmm. um, and and cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT um, ba basically what, what it asks people to do is is consider consider their psychological responses in terms of four domains uh, and and, and sometimes I'll, I'll on a whiteboard I'll, I'll draw a picture uh, um, uh, of a hot cross button like a circle with a cross in it so so your aid memoir is the hot cross bun you know it's mm -hmm. nice kind of sticky memory um and and so we've got these four quadrants that represent the the four psychological response modalities so that's uh, thoughts um emotions or feelings uh your behaviors or, or your actions and your your, your physical or physiological response mm -hmm. And, and we can think about symptoms in those four domains and how they, they interact with each other. Um, because that's often the challenge with anxiety and depression. It's, it's, they've got this really nasty way of maintaining themselves. You know, once you've got it, it keeps itself going. That's because the, the thoughts and the feelings and the behaviors and the physical sensations, they, they feed back on each other. So, so the, 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 the challenge is to break those um, cycles or vicious cycles, as we, we call them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to give you to give you an example, if someone's got a um, a panic disorder, so they have panic attacks. Most people kind of appreciate that a panic attack is this acute 
episode of 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 distress you know um and um and often people when they have their first panic attack or subsequent panic attacks you know they think they're having a um um a heart attack you know because their body is is so active mm-hmm. um and so what that does if we think about those four components of response so so my body's doing this this extreme thing um so i'm thinking am i having a heart attack uh, so and that's going to feed into our emotional state of fear and anxiety which is going to spike up which is going to in turn feed back into our physical state because the the heart palpitations mm-hmm. that's a physical manifestation of anxiety it's not a heart attack so so the the the, the emotional bit revs up the physical bit revs up um, then the thinking is yeah I am having a heart attack and and so we, we it, it, it 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 um it keeps itself going, um, um, and, 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 and it's awful. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, so cognitive behavioral therapy, we, we're looking at breaking those um, maintaining cycles. That's so interesting. It's um, it's a type of becomes a little bit uh, um, type of addiction after because those feelings are so strong on the body, and it's correct to say depression becomes a little bit addiction of with time or there no research to, to yeah. support that um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that but um, I think what what does happen is people get very stuck and and part of the reason they get stuck is you know people people do what they can to get by. Um, in the situation they're in, I think that was, um, I think that was Lauren's quote, right at the end mm-hmm. of, of your podcast with her. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, in, in a in a CBT sense, we talk about people engaging in in safety seeking behaviours. Okay, so the, there's that that behavioural um, component of the hot cross bun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that's what people do to cope. And in an anxiety, it's often avoidance. Um, and in uh, depression, it's often withdrawal. Uh, and, and these things are quite powerfully reinforcing mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, you avoid, you don't have the panic attack. Uh, you know, I, I, so you might think, I'm not going um, to go for a run because if I go for a run, my heart rate, you know, my heart might not cope. Mm-hmm. And so you don't go for a run and you don't have a panic attack and you think, oh, wow. This not going for a run is really working, so it's powerfully reinforcing. And and similarly, someone with depression who withdraws, um, uh, they're going to be thinking to themselves, "Well, well, good, nothing bad has happened." Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, there's been a massive opportunity cost because a lot of good things could have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, perversely, um, people engage in these uh, attempts to seek safety um, that are actually keeping the problem going. But they think they're helping, so so that might speak a little bit to this notion of kind of getting stuck. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Mm, interesting. And what factors promote resilience from from mental mental health issues? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I guess um, you know, in in treating someone with with mental health problems that's the goal you know we want them to get better and not get unwell again mm-hmm. so so as well as um uh you know the 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 the, the treatment the, the 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 transferring of skills you know i, I want to work myself out of a job if you're the client mm-hmm. you know i want us to come together and um kind of work out how it works and and and, and crack it and then you know say goodbye in, a, in an awesome way and and but but also i want you to have um a relapse prevention plan, you know, uh, um, a, a strategies that you can fall back on um, if if you notice warning signs that you're becoming unwell. So, mm-hmm. so, so, yeah. In, in a way, treatment is resilience building. It's focused on on resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, but but in terms of of outside of treatment, um, you know, there there are a lot of of personal qualities that. Um, that are, are part of the solution um, and you know you don't need to do therapy to to get them but the things like um, optimism 
is is massively protective. Um, you know, if you if you notice that you 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 tend to be glass half empty, um, uh, you know, maybe maybe get a self help book on self talk or um, find an app. There's a good one called Think Ladder, I think it's called, um, and and just just just. You know, practice putting your thoughts under a microscope and and and, and ch- checking how valid they are, mm. um, uh, or, or or take the the mindfulness approach to letting go of, of unhelpful thoughts. So so optimism, self efficacy is is this this notion that when people have a sense of um, that they have some control over their outcomes. You know that that they can um, regulate their emotions. That um, uh, you know, there's some hope. Um, um, those sorts of those sorts of personal qualities that can be um, developed um, are massively protective. Um, so there's those sorts of those sorts of things at a kind of um, psychological level. But but the other thing is 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 um, you know the the P E R M A or, mm. or the I love um, that. Uh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the five ways to well being. This mm-hmm. is the the stuff we talked about at the. Um, yeah. Um, at, the, at the workshop at the combat room mm-hmm. with uh, with Callum, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, so, so that's um, and and yeah, there's some fantastic resources on the Mental Health Foundation website uh, about the five ways, and that, that's the way. That's why I, I, you know, if I'm doing a public presentation, I might talk about the five ways because there's this infrastructure around it. You know, mm. you can you can go to the website. You know, you, you, your your workplace, your, your your colleagues. You can you can go to the website and find some activities that you can do to promote the five ways to well-being. Mm-hmm. So those ones, it's a slightly different way of carving it up, but it's it's um, take notice, um, connect, uh, be uh, be active, um, and um, keep keep learning. So there's, um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're just, just, it's just sort of a slight rig, but it's evidence-based. Mm. Um, but yeah, look, there's, there's lots of things you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And resilience, it's a, it's a interesting. Sometimes, for example, students get to me and because they just see the, you no know, using jiu-jitsu as a, yeah, yeah, as yeah. a metaphor, you no, know, just see me as a black belt and said, ah, so, you know, be honest. Did you, you always been good in jiu-jitsu, something like that. And I said, you have no idea. You know, you just have seen the, the 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 result of years and years of practicing. I never was good in any other sport. And jiu-jitsu was something I became passionate about at first. And after, I was seeking to to practice. But this idea of being good or being good or something, it's, it's a consequence of the passion for the mm-hmm. practice and... So resilience, it's the same thing. It's, it's the same thing to, to say we don't born with that. We develop that with some practice. Is that right? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, look for sure. Um, and, but the, the other thing I would say, again, and this is this, this person-environment interaction. Uh, you know, in, in the past, people have thought of resilience as being like a trait. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, you're either resilient or you're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the old... Um, psychological construct was hardiness. You know, someone's hardy. You know, they kind of smash through all their challenges. But, but the 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 research suggests that that's not accurate, and that um, really resilience is a person environment interaction. That um, as well as helpful qualities, um, you know, a massive um, part of the equation is. Um, your, your environment, mm-hmm. you know, um, your so we talk about resilient social environments, um, and and again, this is this is this is where um, you know you're part of a community at the combat room, and and um, um, and that can be really powerful. There's there's two ways that environments can confer resilience, and and one is through um, there being safe. So obviously, you know, if you you trust um, the people in your in your community, um, you're more likely to reach out to them. But also, it's the the notion of um, the this term is called social capital in 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 a in a um, in a group, uh, and that's that's the the sort of resources that a group has. You know, their their capacity to 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 respond. Um, so so you know, it might be maybe you got maybe you you're, you're part of a church. You know, and 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 the church may have um, you know, phone trees that connect peak 
connect people to others who, who are seeking help, you know, um, uh, or it might be a sports club or, 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 or whatever. It might be a cultural group. Um, uh, but it's just there's something about that uh, network that's safe and, and, and has the capacity to make a difference for you. Mm. Um, hu- huge in resilience. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, look after your relationships, look after your communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, and what positive impacts or growth can people experience as a result of recovering from uh, mental illness? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I've, I've become quite quite interested in, in this um, in, in, in recent years. This, um, uh, this notion of post-traumatic growth mm-hmm. has, has become... Um, had an increasing profile, you know, part, partly out of the Christchurch earthquakes, you know, and and um, you go because there's there's that, 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 that sort of large scale trauma is this this notion that um, uh, yeah post traumatic stress. And I think Paul um, Paul Wood spoke really uh, beautifully about this in in, in his podcast mm-hmm. with you that. Um, you know, out of adversity, uh, you know, sometimes that, that, that's your, your optimal growth opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you know, um, recovering from mental illness um, is, um, you know, thriving out of adversity. It's a massive achievement. You know, when I, when I talk to my clients, um, you know, sometimes it's the most satisfying thing they've, they've experienced is to, to come out the other side. And um, uh yeah, yeah. So, so this this notion of post traumatic growth is it's a little bit more than um, kind of seeing the upsides of having gone through something bad. It's it's more almost transformative, you know, like um, changing your values, you know, changing your true north, you know, changing your direction. You know, look at um, look at all the amazing work Paul's done, you know, and, and, and writing his story and putting it out there and all the talks he does, you know. Um, you know, he's really committed um, uh, to 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 honouring the, the 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 changes that he's, he's he's made out of the hard, really hard stuff he's gone through. Mm-hmm. John Kerwin, same same thing. You know, he's he really has committed himself himself to destigmatisation and mental health, and um, and you know, I'm on I'm on the John Kerwin Foundation now, and. Um, um, you know, we 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 we've got all sorts of initiatives that are going on, and and he he's totally committed. It's a big part of his life. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's amazing. And Doctor Elliot, can you please explain the? You gave me this this gift oh, that yeah, you did. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so for the ones that are listening, it's a uh, it's a blue dog. Yeah, so, balloon dog. Balloon dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But in the car, in the car of blue, so you got it upside down. Ah, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. Can you please explain? explain? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I mean, I, I really see you as a um, as a champion for for mental health and well being. So, so I thought I, I've, I've got a few of these, and I, I, don't, I, I give them out from time from time to time. So the oh, the, the, the the balloon dog is it's the um, it's the symbol for the the, the John Kerwin Foundation. The Sir John Kuhn Foundation. Um, where, where it comes from is uh, pe- people will be aware of this notion of the black dog, you know, as a, um, a, a metaphor for, for depression. Uh, I think it's quite an Australian, New Zealand thing. And um, so the, the notion here is, is um, uh, you know, it's important to manage your mental health condition. And, and the, the balloon dog, as well as being a kind of a, a um, it's, it's sort of a, an upbeat sort of positive mm-hmm. thing but it, it, it's 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 man, it, it's manipulated you know you you uh, you make the the balloon dog you it it it, it um it, it's it's it represents this notion of managing um or making change uh and and so the idea is that uh you you, you put your dog um somewhere where people might notice it and then it becomes a talking point so if someone says oh what's what's that you can say well it's it's about looking after your mental health and and yeah, so 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 just it, it, it's a prompt for getting people talking. And I love that. I'm gonna take this right now to combat room. I'm gonna put it there. It's gonna be on the top of the great, desk. Great, great. Yeah, yeah. Let me know how uh, uh, whether it gets people talking. I love that. That's such a such a cool idea. Um, what what do you do to keep your mental health? Um, oh, look, uh, lo- lots of things, and I'm I'm in quite an, a quite a fortunate position in that. Um, you know, I'm kind of immersed in it um, through my work. 
uh, and and I, I love to to road test the techniques mm -hmm. and and I also and, and oftentimes I like I would never prescribe something to a client that I hadn't done myself mm -hmm. and and often I'll, I'll do it with the client you know we, we might do an experiment and mm -hmm. um, experiment with them with, with with doing something a different way and and, and I might try it too and mm -hmm. um, um, but lo lots of things like, like I mean I I, I, I have a meditation a mindfulness practice um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I use the I use the Headspace app. Um, uh, I think it's it's it it it, it, it um, meshes quite well with cognitive behavioural therapy um, because you know um, um, Andy Puttacombe who who um, narrates it and developed it. He you know he talks about thoughts and he talks about feelings and mm -hmm. he talks about behaviours and the distinction between these. He talks about your physical sensations. So so he speaks the same language as a cognitive behavioural therapist would. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I do that. I find um, uh, being being active uh, is really important for me because I've got a very sedentary job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah. I and this is a good opportunity for me to really thank you uh, in the combat room for um, helping me with fundraising for the New York Marathon. You know, yeah, that yeah. was my next question. Yeah. New York Marathon. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. So, talk so about that. Well, well, I <clears throat> I, I had. Um, I'd gotten a shoulder injury, um, and, and, and it was really, um, it's, it's called adhesive capsulitis. And mm, has um, been for a few years now. Yeah, I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's fine now, it's, it's great, but um, uh, yeah, it was interfering with my ability to do BJJ, and, mm -hmm. and um, so I wanted to do something else. So I, I, I started running a bit more, and um, I was coming up uh, for my 50th birthday, and uh, my wife and I were looking for. I'd rather I'd rather have an experience than a big party, you know. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of the, the, the what, what I prefer, and um, and yeah, yeah. The, the 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 planets all seem to line up because the New York Marathon 2018 was on my was on my 51st birthday. So on my 50th, I started training, uh, uh, fundraised along the way. Thank you, Combat mm -hmm. Room, for your donation, uh, and yeah, ran it on the. Um, uh, yeah, um, um, the 2018 event, um, and I've kept running since, mm -hmm. and and, um, uh, and and it's good. It gives me a sense of achievement. It's also um, it's quite hard, you know, running is for me anyway. You know, running marathons. I've I've only run two now, but I've done lots and lots of half marathons and and other runs. Um, but but I think it's it's I think it's good for me to to do hard things that, that, that kind of challenge me because you know I'm expecting my clients to do hard things mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I think at some level it, it helps me connect with uh, the challenges that, that they have um, so so yeah yeah um, yeah it's it's so for, for me um, I, I, I try to look after um, you know my well-being through through things like mindfulness and and exercise and and you know the the right company and and mm -hmm. i think diet's really really important mm -hmm. um sleep massively um yeah yeah those 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 would be the big ones um you know sleep nutrition relaxation you know some sort of um looking after your your, your thinking process um and and exercise yeah mm -hmm. that's so interesting so what's your advice for someone that's not feeling well at the moment uh, what what they should do? Should um, yeah, get away from this yeah, cycle. Well, yeah, well, look, seek seek help is mm. is the the first port of call, and um, you know I think Theo uh, spoke really well about this. Theo Dorfling, um, mm -hmm. in in his podcast, uh, you know, find someone who you trust and and just open up to them. Um, uh, you know, then you've got an advocate and a confidant and someone who can maybe help you. Um, you, you know, take that ex next step, which might be to to a health professional. And and uh, you know, I, I think it's you know, if you haven't got a good GP, uh, I'd really recommend you get one because um, yeah, sometimes you know you struggle. It, it it might be a physical, an undetected physical illness, and 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 even if it's if it's not, if the GP detects you know rules that out, you know they're in a good position to maybe refer you to a mental health professional. Uh, if that's if that's needed yeah 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 i'm i'm so happy as well to hear from someone like yourself 
coming from the science background and and you know you mentioned so many times the mindfulness and, and meditation yeah and also the you know the physical activity being you know the foundation for 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 a good mental mental health right mm. yeah yeah it's um I, I know that that mindfulness it's become a bit sort of buzzy and mm -hmm. trendy hasn't yeah, it um yeah. uh but you know um the 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 evidence is there and i think it, it kind of makes sense doesn't it in this this sort of increasingly overstimulated world that we live in because of you know everything that's happens and is available online that uh, you know it, it it sort of hits the mark for people just just to 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 disconnect and 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 experience um peace and solitude and and observe and 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 not get sort of pulled along by by external stimulation mm -hmm. so it, it sort of makes perfect sense in the way in a way and um yeah certainly it's been you know contemporary cognitive behavioral therapies have really embraced mindfulness it's um so it's more a kind of a, a you know a western psychological um, formulation of mindfulness as, as opposed to the the eastern um spiritual religious tradition um and that's not to 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 sort of promote one over the other at all um um uh you know if if not for for the eastern way they mm -hmm. you know wouldn't be here but there's um uh yeah in fact one of the most powerful um, treatments for chronic depression and that's for people who uh, you know it's, it's depression's episodic you have an episode and, and some people if you have one episode you've got a better chance of having two and if you've got two you've got very high chance of having three and so um, the challenge often is is not getting unwell again and and the uh, there's a strong evidence base for this this thing called mindfulness based cognitive therapy which which is a structured group program um, that that includes a lot of mindfulness um, in it like you know 20 30 40 even minutes a day sometimes mm. um and uh yeah you know there's there's something incredibly powerful and again i think i might have already mentioned this but about that 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 realization that a thought is just a thought you, you know and and um for someone who's depressed you know that can be quite a quite a powerful realization because mm -hmm. if you've if you've been depressed um, it can be so aversive that um, you know it's easy to to get triggered into a new episode. You know, like um, um, you might get the flu and feel really kind of achy, and that might remind you of when you were depressed. And you can almost think yourself into a depression from that point. So, so it's the, there's that power of okay, I recognise this thought. You know, I, I, I can see it happening. Like, you know. You know, standing behind the waterfall and you know watching mm -hmm. the water just that space enables you to let go the unhelpful thought um, and break the maintaining cycle that we've been talking about yeah. mm -hmm. that's amazing yeah dr Elliot, thank you thank you so much that's so valuable so much no. wisdom and this conversation yeah, i really really enjoyed thank you so much for your time again you know you've been a good friend and inspiration as well remember i said i start you know study psychology yeah, because yeah. i said all the people i admire you know it's on the psychology field you know the, the right. majority and, and of course you're one of those yeah, those ones, yeah and yeah. You've been really supportive as well to meet you going back to university and study psychology so thank you so much and please yeah, if my pleasure. if people want to know more about your work what you're doing how how can they find more about you um, yourself i'll probably probably google um google me and and, and look at the university of otago wellington uh web page mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty about me there. And, and let me also say vincent i mean thank you for all the the great work you're doing in your community you know you're really um you know you're, you're promoting well-being big time and, and you've you've got a um uh, a group that people connect with can connect with to enhance their well-being so um yeah it's fantastic fantastic mm. thank you thank you so much no problem <laughs>